If you came into my office and I asked you how many statues I have there, you'd no doubt say one. It's the statue you see in front of you here. It's a bust of Albert Einstein. But strangely enough, there actually might be a reason to think that there are two statues in my office. There is this statue that you see in front of you, the common sense statue. It has color and texture. It's solid. You can't pass through it. It's everything you'd come to expect from a normal statue. But according to particle physics, there's also another statue here. It's a statue that you'd see only if you could magnify in very closely. It's a statue composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons. It's mostly empty space, about 98% empty space, in fact. There is no color, there is no texture at this level for this statue. All there is is charges and fields and so forth. So we have, it appears, two separate statues, the common sense statue and the scientific statue. How are we to make sense of this riddle? This is an example of a problem that comes from Sir Arthur Eddington, one of the most preeminent physicists of the first half of the 20th century. He wrote an essay entitled My Two Tables, in which he gave this basic problem using tables instead of statues, but the same basic point holds. Realize why this is a conundrum. On the one hand, science is supposed to be based on empiricism, what we can see, taste, touch, hear, and so forth. And what we see, taste, touch, hear, and so forth is a solid statue with various colors, textures, and other macro properties. But if we follow these, the same sense perception further, we end up finding out that none of these things appear to be real in the scientific sense of the word. Instead, what's real is simply these micro properties, the protons, the electrons, the charge, the fields, and so forth. How exactly should we resolve this phenomenon? Now, recognize that we can't really appeal to science itself to make sense of this problem, since science itself is part of what's giving rise to the problem. This is a classic problem in the philosophy of science. I found that a lot of people here on YouTube, even scientifically literate and educated people, while they may understand science, they don't really have a terribly good grasp on the philosophical foundations of science. I want to try to alleviate that as much as I can with a short video series here that's going to cover basically the, the, the introduction to the philosophy of science. So, why should we study the philosophy of science? Why should we be interested in it? Well, first off, because problems like that one are just weird. You know, are, are there two statues or are there one statues? How can sense perception and empiricism seem to lead us into mutually incompatible directions like that? That little, that puzzle, that paradox that Eddington gives us, that's something that deserves our attention, that deserves our thought. Another issue is the fact that science is the most powerful tool that humanity has developed to understand and control the world. Science pervades pretty much every single aspect of our lives, not the least of which, of course, is the computer on which I'm making this video, the computer upon which you're watching it, and the internet which is connecting the two of them. Every single one of us trusts our lives to science in multiple ways every single day, from engineering to medicine to physics to biology to all sorts of other respects in which we obviously trust and depend on science. It makes sense that we should try to figure out how science works. Well. Maybe that explains why we should study science, but why should we study the philosophy of science? That seems like a separate issue. And the reason why is because philosophy is one of, if not the, best tool that human beings have for penetrating confusion and obscurity. If you do it right, if you think clearly, philosophy can build bridges across incomprehension and chaos. That's a phrase I'm stealing from Tom Stoppard, by the way. Now, when done wrong, of course, philosophy can become horribly confusing and can make a complex problem all the worse. That's not a problem for philosophy, though. That's a problem for bad philosophy. We have to do philosophy well, regardless of whether we're talking about the philosophy of science or any other field of philosophy. Science is a complex phenomenon, and like any other complex phenomenon, it needs to be studied, it needs to be scrutinized, it needs to be carefully understood. And when you do that, you are engaging in the philosophy of science, not science itself. So, another way of understanding the relationship between philosophy and science is actually by looking at history. The next video I intend to make in this series actually will be a brief history of science. For most of history, what we today call science was actually a branch of philosophy. Were you to go back in time and talk to Isaac Newton and ask him his occupation, he would not describe himself as a scientist. He would describe himself as a natural 
philosopher. Science was the branch of philosophy that studied the natural world. That was the case from the pre-Socratics up until at least the 1700s. It was only in the 1700s that science really became an autonomous discipline all unto itself. Um, uh, my, one of my philosophy professors, when I was an undergrad, put the point this way. He said, science is just philosophy that worked. And perhaps it implies that, that someday the philo today's philosophy will become tomorrow's science. It's one way of looking at the relationship between the two. Now, some questions today still seem to sort of bridge the gap between philosophy and science. So, for example, when you think about a question like, what is space? Or what is time? To an extent, this is a philosophical question, and to an extent, this is a scientific question. I've talked in previous videos about quantum mechanics. How should we interpret quantum mechanics? Should we go with the many worlds hypothesis, or should we go with the Copenhagen interpretation? This is a scientific question. It's a question that needs to be discussed by scientists. But when they're doing it, they're really not doing science per se. They're doing philosophy. So scientifically informed philosophers and philosophically inclined scientists are the ones who need to have this kind of conversation. And that can't really happen unless these two disciplines are in a position to mutually understand one another. So what are some of, some of those few major questions that I plan to be looking at? Well, what about, what is the difference precisely between science and pseudoscience? Uh, standard example here is astronomy is clearly a science and astrology is clearly a pseudoscience. But exactly what is the difference? What is it that makes astrology a pseudoscience and astronomy a legitimate science? Uh, there, that's not as clear cut an issue as it might seem at first glance. Another issue, when is a scientific generalization justified? When can we go from, okay, we have this data set, so it's fair to say, based on this data set, that we have here a, a natural law of some kind, or, or at least a regularity which we can reliably trust on. How do we know how much data we need in order to, 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 to make that leap? How, what do we do with data that doesn't seem to fit that general mold, that doesn't seem to fit that natural law? How can we distinguish, in other words, between coincidences and natural laws? Again, at first glance, that might seem like an obvious question, but I hope that if you stick with this series, you'll find out it's actually a lot more difficult than you might realize. Another issue. Is it the case that all sciences are ultimately reducible to physics? It's sometimes argued that really, fundamentally, psychology should be explained in terms of biology and, and, and neurophysiology, and, and that can fundamentally be explained in terms of chemistry, and chemistry can fundamentally be explained in terms of physics. Ultimately, all science is reduced to physics. This kind of reductionistic approach uh, it is popular in some circles, usually, of course, amongst physicists who like to think of their, their discipline as the only true science. Um, fairly famous quote, I'm forgetting who said it at the moment, uh, uh, but some important quantum physicist once said that all, all science is either physics or stamp collecting. Um, and again, an argument can be made for this view, but an argument has to be made for this view. It, it doesn't get to win by default, so we have to sort of uh, figure out precisely how we would adjudicate this kind of question. And when we do that, we are engaged in the philosophy of science. Next set of questions. Does science describe reality, or is it simply sort of a useful tool? It's not really talking about the fundamental structure of reality. It's just a way of, you know, that human beings can sort of talk about, what, about their experiences in a way that helps them manipulate their experiences. Um, so if you think about uh, entities like quarks and electrons and so forth, are these real entities? Do they actually exist? Or are they simply sort of hypothetical entities? Things that are sort of posited so our scientific models can make sense of our uh, macro empirical data. Again, arguments can be made on both sides of this. And so in order to do that, we have to do some very, pretty complex philosophy of science. Lastly, is science objective, whatever that word might mean, or, or does it have sort of an inherent bias, an inherent perspective, an inherent subjectivity that prevents it from being objective? I mean, scientists do, of course, try to just follow the evidence and, and go where the evidence leads, but they are only human after all. They're subject to the same sort of prejudices and biases that all human beings are. Now, maybe those prejudices and biases wash out collectively or wash out over time, or maybe they're supposed to, but don't actually do that. So that's the kind of question that we're going to want to uh, have a better grasp on by the time this series is done with. Okay, here's sort of a brief outline of the series as I'm imagining it. I can't promise I will necessarily stick to this outline, but this is what I'm envisioning for the next several videos. So this first video here is just sort of a general overview and a general introduction. The next video, like I say, should be a brief history of science. Uh, the third video will be a sort of give us three views, general views on the nature of science. The fourth, we'll talk about the rise of logical positivism, and the fifth, we'll talk about the fall of logical positivism. Uh, the, the, the majority of these videos, you know, starting from four on, will be talking about philosophy of science in the 20th century.
Um, the, the sixth video, we'll talk about the problem of induction, which is, of course, a, a classic problem dating back at least as far as David Hume, but we'll talk about how it has uh, modified in the 20th century. The seventh video, we'll talk about the problem of confirmation. The eighth, we'll talk about Karl Popper, a name that's probably familiar to at least some of you and his ideas of unfalsificationism. The ninth and the tenth lectures will focus on Thomas Kuhn, probably the single most important philosopher of science in the 20th century. Uh, the eleventh lecture will talk about Emir Lakatos and his idea of a research tradition. And then the twelfth, and for the moment what I'm expecting to be the final lecture, will talk about the self-proclaimed epistemological anarchist Paul Feyerabend and his very revolutionary ideas about science.